Hello AP Psych students, this is Mr. Monroe report reporting from my empty room on Thursday afternoon. Tomorrow is Friday, March 8th, I believe, and um, I would have actually been in school tomorrow with you guys, but of course we have the online learning day as a result of Hugo Chavez's passing, so so here it is. This is what I'll be doing with you for, for, for Friday. I will be looking and going through with you this PowerPoint on abnormal psychology. This is what we would have talked about had we had school here. And so what I'm going to do is um, you're going to be listening to my voice as I go through the beginnings of this PowerPoint presentation. We won't make it through all of it, but uh, it's your job to listen to me. Um, to hopefully understand the concepts a little better by listening to me explain some of them. And uh, and yeah, and then we'll just go from there. We can talk more about it on Tuesday when we all show up to school and and. Uh, you see me. So, so with that said, let, let's do it. Now, usually in my experience, you know, this is, <laughs> students are usually pretty excited to talk about this, of normal psychology. And, <coughs> excuse me, it's kind of interesting. Why? Because of normal psychology, I, I guess it fascinates us all in a way. I mean, if you think about some of the different ways people are weird, and I guess abnormal psychology goes a little beyond just being weird, um, goes much further than that actually but nevertheless that fascinates us you know depression that fascinates us a little bit you know if somebody's depressed why are they depressed what made them depressed you know you, you tend to ask yourselves those questions even if you may have depression yourself you may ask yourself that question where did this come from why am I so depressed how, and more importantly how can I help myself and but that is not a topic until next unit which is treatment of psychological disorders so for now we're just going to be talking about abnormalities um, with people's psychology and, and the way they think and perceive things. And so with that, <clears throat> I guess let's continue. Um, let's see, this is my first time doing this, so I have to warn you, if there's any awkward pauses, any screw-ups in any way of what I say, um, hey, you're probably used to that anyways from class. But but if, if, if I cause you any kind of unwanted feelings because of my awkwardness talking I'm sorry for that I'm making myself feel awkward just by doing this this is strange for me so um, let's see here okay so <clears throat> moving on there we go all right so this is kind of the unit overview this is what we're gonna be going through now today you can see uh, the very top two uh, bullet points here are the perspectives on psychological disorders and then the second bullet is anxiety disorders. Those are the two things I'll be talking uh, to you about right now. Uh, all the other ones we'll save until Tuesday. We'll, we'll start moving into that. On Tuesday I, I expect to show you some videos uh, that have to do with anxiety disorders um, such as depression, um, uh, what's another one? Phobias. Phobias are always interesting. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Those are all anxiety disorders that we'll watch videos on on Tuesday. And we'll also talk about somatoform disorders and dissociative disorders also on Tuesday. And then finally on Thursday before our two-week vacation, I will talk to you about depression, right, which is here, mood disorders. Um, and then it will be your responsibility over vacation to learn about schizophrenia, personality disorders, and rates of disorder. Um, I actually have a, a video I want you to watch on schizophrenia that you might find interesting. So, so this is what we'll talk about in the next week. All right, so I'm sorry if I'm rambling here. Um, let's move on. All right, so <clears throat> the introduction to this, right? Here are some questions that we have to kind of ask ourselves as we're moving through this, right, at the very beginning stages. Uh, first, how should we define psychological disorders? That's very 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 important because again um, you know if, if we go back to unit I believe two on research methods we always have to be careful about how we define things because if you don't define things clearly and in a uniform manner then there's going to be inconsistencies and that's very very bad especially in terms of abnormal uh, abnormal psychology um, you need to be consistent you can't be um, diagnosing one person with depression because of a certain set of uh, behaviors that they, they, they show, and then not diagnose another person with those same behaviors. So it's very important that we define psychological disorders very clearly. So let's, let's so, you know, think about that a little bit, and we'll talk about that shortly. So a second question, how should we understand disorders? Okay, that's another important question we have to look at ourselves, right? When we look at depression, how do we understand that? What do we understand that to be? You know, is it a true um, abnormality of somebody? Is it their fault? Is it not their fault? You know, things like that we have to think about when we're looking at understanding disorders. And then lastly here, how should we classify psychological disorders? All right, so let's move on. Um, perspectives on psych 
uh, psychological disorders. I already talked to you about that. All right, here we go. So <clears throat> let's start with defining what a psychological disorder is. All right, you can see here that I have psychological disorders in the three um, hash marks underneath it. Um, first thing is a, psycho a psychological disorder must show deviant behavior. Now, what is the meaning of deviant? Deviant is a term that um, that implies that somebody is is that somebody has behavior that is is very different from the average person in their society. Okay, that might be, for instance, me at a job interview picking my nose and eating my boogers. That would be very deviant because why? Most people, vast majority of people in that case, I think, would not pick their nose and eat it. In, in a job interview all right so that's very deviant behavior or how about this me one day coming to school as a teacher in a dress high heels and lipstick now sorry for the mental image there but that would be very deviant behavior you don't see uh, you know teachers trying to dress as the opposite sex really anywhere in society never less a teacher trying to teach students um, so that those are two examples of deviant behavior I mean there's a long list of different things that you could consider deviant but um, Psychological disorder must be deviant. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking at a text from my wife to see how she's doing. Uh, great. Okay. All right. My wife is fine. And as soon as I'm done with this, I'm going to go home to see her. But all right. So deviant behavior. Two examples there. That must be shown in a psychological disorder. Another thing is distressful behavior. Distressful behavior. Um, when we're looking at distressful behavior, um, you know, showing that somebody is distressed is showing that, you know, there may be, uh, I'm trying to think of a good word here, I was going to say flummoxed, but that's kind of a bad word to use. You know, when they're distressed, they're, you know, they seem all over the place, they don't seem calm, you know, they seem very nervous, upset, things like that. Okay, so that's, that's also another sign of a psychological disorder is when people are outwardly uh, shown to be just not in a stable condition. All right, and then the last hash mark here that I have, whoop, Sorry about that, guys. There we go. The last hash mark here is harmful dysfunctional behavior. Now, you may have these two things, deviant behavior and distressful behavior, okay? But without this last one, it can't be a disorder, right? It has to be harmful in some way to yourself or to people around you. Um, now, me showing up in a dress and lipstick. Let's go with that because I said that was deviant behavior, and it certainly is. Is it distressful behavior? You know, maybe not. You know, that's the thing. Now, it might be distressful to you having to watch me. Um, but if I came in dressed like that, uh, it's not particularly distressful. Anything, actually, you'd probably find it very funny and laugh at me. And I'd probably have to quit my job and leave because you guys would never take me seriously ever, ever again. Um, but it's not really distressful behavior, especially on my part. It, I don't think it would be distressful if I voluntarily did it. Um, but it's certainly not necessarily harmful to myself, either physically or psychologically per se. Uh, again, maybe to you guys, but not so much to me. Um, and even any damage it does to you guys having to look at me dressed like that, I wouldn't, wouldn't have any like long-lasting uh, harmful effects on you as a person. Again, you'd probably think it's more funny than anything. So it must be harmful. A good example of this, which we'll talk about, is phobias, our phobias. Phobias are extreme Fears. Now, extreme is the key word there, extreme fears of something. And those can be dysfunctional because they prevent somebody from doing something. And that can be very bad. I'll get more into that later, though. Okay. So looking at this, definition varies by context and culture. That's also extremely important when we're talking about defining psychological disorders. Now, I want to kind of give you just a kind of idea here when we're looking at this, right? And we, this also uh, relates to deviant behaviors as well. What is deviant? What isn't deviant? But um, let's look at uh, some things, some behaviors in some cultures that would be really abnormal, let's say, in the United States or Venezuela, okay? So here, here, here are three examples that I'm going to give to you. For instance, and actually in Venezuela, this is more normal than it is in the United States, but hissing is a polite way to show respect for superiors in Japan. That seems kind of strange. I mean, I hear people hiss a lot here when you're trying to get somebody's attention, you know, that, tss, tss, you know, and, and a lot of people seem, you know, seem, or they, they, they seem to be not phased by it, you know, it's not really abnormal for them. For me, though, when people hiss at me, it kind of annoys me, I'm like, what are you hissing at me for, what do I do? You know, in the United States, that's not usually a great way to get somebody's attention. It's usually a sign of aggression or, or something like that, or just disrespect, really. But it's the opposite in Japan. 
Um, so that's one thing. Uh, another one is, and you guys are going to find this one interesting, among the Karaki of New Guinea, which is uh, a country that is in, um, and that's not Papua New Guinea, New Guinea is in Africa, sorry. So along, among this tribe, a man is considered abnormal, I repeat, a man is considered abnormal if he is not engaged in homosexual behavior before marriage. Now, I'm going to let that process for a second. You know, uh, in our cultures, especially Venezuela's culture, uh, Venezuelan culture, um, you know, for some people, for some classes of people, you know, upper classes, having even just sex in general before marriage may be somewhat taboo. Never, never mind having homosexual behavior, homosexual um, experiences. Uh, for many people, that would be very, very deviant behavior. Um, and so, and in the United States, same thing. Not as much, I don't think, as here in Venezuela, but nevertheless still would be considered abnormal. Um, especially if you weren't homosexual, that's the thing. Um, you know, this, this group in New Guinea, even if you are heterosexual, it is still abnormal if you don't have, a, have sex with, man, with a man before being married. So, again, let that process think about that one. Um, and then the last example I give you is public displays of affection between men and women in Thailand are unacceptable. Those two things are acceptable in, in Venezuelan and American culture. Interestingly, however, men holding hands is considered a sign of friendship there. You don't see that here. If you saw that here, you'd probably get made fun of and yelled at uh, as you're walking down the street. In the United States, again, you would, not to the same extent as in Venezuela. But um, additionally, here's another thing. The use of straws in Thailand is considered vulgar. Now, for all you straw loving Venezuelans out there, I've seen Cesar running around once in a while with a straw hanging out of his, his can of Coke or something like that. Straws are huge here, and so that's actually considered vulgar in Thailand. In the United States, it isn't. That's more like Venezuela. All right, so there's a couple examples for you. So when we're looking at context and culture and deviant behavior and all those things, it really depends on culture because what one culture may define as abnormal, deviant behavior, another culture might look at it as perfectly normal. So we have to be careful uh, how we go about defining you know, certain abnormalities. All right, and then uh, finally, and, and this really doesn't necessarily have to do with um, the definition of psychological disorders, but when we're talking about definitions, so maybe I should do something like that. Definitions varies by cultural context. If anybody knows who this is, if anybody knows what this is, that's good. If you don't, um, it's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. This is basically... Um, it's not a severe disorder, but it is a disorder nonetheless. Um, one that is actually there's a lot of debate over because a lot of people say, well, is this just people acting normal, or is this, you know, us as a society overdiagnosing people with something that we shouldn't be? All right. So, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder really kind of is based on a couple different things here. Um, one is extreme hyperactivity, right? So hyperactivity, they're they're you know, uh, jumpy, fidgety, things like that. Um, you know, tons and tons of energy. Um, another part of this is the attention part. Another part of this definition is the attention part, which is extreme inattention, meaning that you have an extreme difficult time paying attention to something. Okay, and so those two things are really very important when you're when you're looking at ADD. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else there. Oh yeah, and then there's impulsivity is another thing which isn't in the actual word it's in, in the term itself. Uh, impulsivity is just when you do things on an impulse and you don't think about things before you do it. So those three things, impulsivity, extreme inattention, and hyperactivity are the three things that make up ADHD. And so now the, the criticism here is, is, again, are we just labeling people that just have high energy? Is that a bad thing for somebody to have high energy? You know, the people that usually get diagnosed with this are people that are young, Little kids, ta not toddlers, uh, it's such around age five to seven, maybe you can start seeing signs of it. So around like late elementary school to, to middle school, and even in high school, people get diagnosed with this. Um, adults more commonly are getting diagnosed with it now. But really, it, 
it, it has a larger effect, a more profound effect on younger people because they have a hard, harder time controlling it, whereas adults can control ADD or ADHD much better than young kids can. Um, so, so that's where, we, where, where, especially me as a teacher, really hears about it because from time to time I hear about a student that has ADD or ADHD, and 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 so I have to think about that while teaching them. Um, so, not a bad disorder to have per se, but it, it just makes things a little more difficult, especially in terms of paying attention to class when you're sitting at your desk. And if you have the hyperactivity part of it, it's really hard to sit in that seat for an hour and a half listening to a teacher talk or um, reading, let's say, a passage from a book or whatever it may be. So those two things mixed together make it really difficult sometimes for students to do well in school. Um, so, but again, are we over-diagnosing this? All right, that's, you know, that's something to think about here. Um, and, and again, this, you know, I'm talking about ADD because we're talking about the definition of psychological disorders here. And so, um, you know, just something to think about here. Is this a genuine disorder or is it not a genuine disorder? Again, you know, what are we defining as abnormal? All right. So moving on from that, guys. Um, sorry if I dwelled on that one page there that long. But to kind of go back in history a little bit, let's talk about how people in the past used to to look at abnormalities in, in the way people behaved, abnormal psychology. Now, this all really started to change with this gentleman right here, Philippe Pinel. Uh, he was from France, and I think if I have my back straight, let me look here. All right, so he, he lived around uh, the late 1700s to the early 1800s, and so this was really one of the first people that made a, a, a earnest attempt to, to change the way we treated uh, people that we considered to be abnormal or people that we considered to have mental illness. Um, so before, you can see this, <laughs> you can see this picture here and, and get an idea. In the past, we used to treat, in some cases, in some countries, we used to treat mental illness by drilling holes in people's skulls and in hopes of uh, the evil spirits being released from their bodies. Now, a lot of these <laughs> abnormal, uh, abnormal psychological disorders that um, people used to do this for is something like schizophrenia, where behavior is really extreme and it's really hard to deal with. If you, you know, if you're uh, a friend or relative or somebody being around somebody with schizophrenia, um, so they wondered how could somebody act like this? What is wrong with them? And they didn't have scientific answers for it. So what did they do? They turned to the good book, the the Bible, and and you know, they thought somebody must be possessing them in some way, shape, or form. And so uh, the only thing they could come up with is drill holes in their skull and let the evil spirits, you know, escape from their brain. Now, did this work? Well, I'm not even going to answer that. I think you can do that yourself. Um, here in this picture, you see people, uh, you know, what seems to be you know, doing some kind of dance to try to, to release the evil spirits from them, you know, something like that. So they had really bizarre ways of, of trying to do this. Now, Philippe Pinel realized that this is dumb or was dumb, and we have to change this. Um, he devised something basically called the, the medical model. He first looked at mental illnesses as uh, as something that was kind of, Within us, he looked at it as as actually something wrong with with our brains itself, with our brain itself. And so, uh, let me look here. Um, so he looked at that. He said, "This is a mental illness. It's it's something that's in us. We can't control it. And to help somebody with these mental illnesses, we have to actually diagnose the mental illness. We have to figure out what it is that they have. What behaviors are they showing?" All right, that's very important. Diagnosis, and uh, they have to do this on the basis of symptoms. Symptoms are basically behaviors. You know, do you talk a lot? Do you cry a lot? Are you sad a lot? Um, you know, are you screaming at people a lot? Are you violent? Right? Those kind of behaviors can be symptoms of something larger. Um, you know, for instance, symptoms of depression. You guys might already be able to come up with these symptoms of depression. Maybe um, uh, long-lasting. Uh, sadness that somebody kind of displays. Uh, it could be crying. Um, it could be, uh, ex you know, the way you express your feelings and express opinions. They may be negative more often than positive. And so those different things can be symptoms of depression, uh, just to kind of give you an example and help you out with that. Right. And then uh, the medical model also says that these illnesses 
can and must try to be cured through therapy. Um, and therapy can include being in a psychiatric hospital um, that, that removes you from, you know, anything that may be causing, you know, your illness. And so Philippe Pinel was the first person to, to move us in that direction. So thanks to him for that, really, in many ways. Um, so understanding psychological disorders, right? The biopsychosocial approach. You guys love this. I know you do. Um, the interaction of nature and nurture. Again, this is something that we have to think about when we're doing this. Um, you know, of course, which one is it? What causes mental illness? Is it nature or is it nurture? I, I can already see it right now. Seb saying to himself, and out loud probably, it's both, mister. Well, you're right, Seth, and everybody else who was thinking that same thing. It is a mixture of both, for sure. For a long time, we thought it was nature. We thought that, um, again, maybe it was, well, actually, that's more religious, but um, we thought that it was something wrong with our brain. You know, and as time moved on, has moved on, we've, we've looked at it as both, but we've seen that there is a big part of nurture in there, too. Our environment does certainly play a big role in creating mental illness sometimes. But... There's also the, the biological aspect of it. So both things are involved. Um, influence of culture on disorders. Again, that's also your environment, right? Cultures sometimes, again, going back to what's proper in Japan and what's proper in the United States, you know what I mean? Uh, deviant behavior. So uh, culture, you know, a certain culture may, may deem something um, a mental illness while another may not. So let's look at this. Actually, I haven't looked at this in a while, this cartoon. Um, Always like this, and my family was wondering if you could prescribe a mild depressant. Okay, not the funniest cartoon we've read in class, but all right. Uh, classifying psychological disorders. Now, the the medical fields or the psychiatric fields go-to guide on diagnosing mental disorders and mental illnesses is the DSM-4-TR, right? They actually say that the DSM-5 will be coming out shortly, but um, I, I just Googled it. And I didn't see anything definitive on it. Um, but the DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual on Mental Disorders, DSM. And then the four signifies the fourth version. And the TR stands for something revised. So it's the revised fourth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical uh, manual. So this is the go-to thing here now, guys. Um, international classification of diseases. That's another one. The ICD-10. I believe this one is um, is 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 uh, the one that the United Nations actually looks at. I believe. I'm not positive on that, but I think it is. Um, and then, of course, there are criticisms of this too. There are always going to be criticisms when you try to diagnose mental illnesses. One group of people may say, "Well, I don't think that symptom is a is a, a sign of schizophrenia, let's say, or ADHD." Other people may think that. So now, um, I went to a website here. I just typed in um, uh, the DSM-4 TR, and this is this is one of the big websites that I saw. Oh, I'm sorry, right here, um, the All Psych Online. Uh, this talks about the the, the DSM here. And so it's actually pretty cool. You see the categories on the side here. Psychiatric Disorder Home, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is, again, what we're just talking about, right? And it talks about all the things I'm going to get into. But this website's actually pretty neat because it talks about a lot of different things. It talks about adjustment disorders. It talks about anxiety disorders, dissociative disorders. This is split personality, for instance, just to give you an idea what a dissociative disorder is. Eating disorder. Excuse me, I just kind of hiccup burped at the same time. All right, eating disorders, impulse control disorders, mood disorders, sexual disorders, sleep disorders, such as insomnia, which we talked about in unit, I believe, five on states of consciousness, psychotic disorders, you know, antisocial behavior, sexual dysfunctions, somatoform disorders, substance disorders, like addiction, you know, things like that. So it actually gets into a lot of interesting things here. So let's go back to the um, PowerPoint presentation here, right? Because in your book, you're going to see this chart, I believe, that, that kind of helps clarify what the DSM kind of looks like or so um, so usually um, all of anything that a, a doctor a psychiatrist may may diagnose is based on assessments interviews observations and many clinicians diagnose by answering the following questions from the five levels or axes of the DSM 4 TR right so that's very important so you let's say I'm a psychiatrist you come to me with uh, what you think is depression I sit down right and um, I look at the questions we're going to look at right here, the at different axes, and um, if they're all, you know, if they all match up with the DSM, then I can 
confidently say that yes, you do have depression. So let's look at this. Axis one is a clinical syndrome present. All right. So let's go here. Okay, that's not working. Ouch. All right. Okay, there we go. That's what I want to see. All right. So is a Clinical syndrome present. Here are some of the things that we're going to look at. Using specifically defined criteria, clinicians may select none, one, or more syndromes from the following list. Let's look at the first one. Disorders usually first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, or adolescence. Let's see. Um, right, and we look at this clinical syndrome present. Our mood disorders present. Our anxiety disorders present. Eating disorders present. You know, things like that. Okay. So, so access two is a personality disorder or mental retardation present, all right? Uh, that's also important. Clinicians may or may, well, let's go back up so I don't go too far here. Clinicians may or may not also select one of these two conditions, all right? Axis three is a general medical condition such as diabetes, hypertension, or arthritis also present, okay? Now, why is that important, you might ask, right? A general medical condition, because a lot of the times, psychological disorders may lead to these. They may lead to diabetes or hypertension or arthritis. You know, not all the time, but in some cases they may. All right, access four, a psychosocial and environmental problems such as school or housing issues also present, right? And this is getting to the, the nurture aspect of psychological disorders, right? Do your parents beat you? Do you live in extreme poverty where um, you only eat maybe one meal a day or, um, you know, you don't have enough clothes to wear and you're cold every night when you go to sleep, which, you know, prevents you from sleeping. You know, all those things can cause psychological disorders. So at the access for it, that question is also, uh, is also asked and hopefully answered. All right, and then the last question here, the last axis, is what is the global assessment of this person's functioning? Clinicians assign a code from 0 to 100. Now, that's the area I know least about exactly, right? The global assessment of this person's functioning. Um, so um, I can't really get into too much depth on that for you. But uh, but anyway, so that's that's kind of what's done. Um, and so if, if all the things match up correctly, then uh, psychiatrist, psychologist can diagnose you. All right, so the biopsychosocial approach to psychological disorders, uh, going back to this. Now, here are some of the biological influences. Evolution, for instance. Evolution can be, in fact, of course, um, um, can be a reason why uh, we may have a psychological disorder. One may be a phobia of spiders. Well, how would that have to do with evolution? Well, back in the day, people needed to be afraid of spiders because, you know, they didn't have a way of classifying spiders in, in which one's poisonous, which one isn't. And so if you're afraid of all spiders, then at least you are safe from being bitten by one, hopefully. You know, whereas if you didn't have a fear of spiders, you'd like try to play with it like, you know, you or I would play with our like a little puppy because they're cute and fuzzy and f furry. You know, somebody might look at a spider and be like, oh, that's so cute. You know, so let's play with it. And then it bites you and you die. Um, so over time, people realize spiders bad. So it actually somehow got worked into our, our genetic code that maybe we should be afraid of these things. Now, not everybody is afraid of them or has a phobia of them, but um, the, the percentages in the favor of looking at, um, you know, let's say certain phobias having an evolutionary explanation. And so, all right, and then there's individual genes, right? You know, some people um, are just more inclined to be depressed than others, for instance. That's just one of the, the psychological disorders we can talk about here, or, you know. Um, Again, whether it's just having not enough serotonin in our brain, you know, that the neurotransmitter that's associated with depression, you know, um, one person may have more serotonin than the other. And so as a result, one person has the disorder of depression and the other doesn't. You know, that's just kind of how life is. Everybody's different. Uh, brain structure and chemistry. Again, that goes to what I was saying with individual genes. Some people having more uh, serotonin than another person. Um, and then brain structure. Sometimes if the actual structures within your brain are, are defective or just abnormal, then that can create some kind of psychological disorder. I think that would make sense. Um, so the psychological influences on psychological disorders are stress, right? So somebody that's in war is, is prone to have an, a psychological disorder more than somebody that, um, you know, lives on a farm somewhere in a very peaceful environment and has a loving family and loving friends. So all those things can can play a role. So stress is important. Trauma, which kind of is involved with stress, especially if like, 
you know, you're at war and you see people get killed and blown up and little kids get killed or people get raped or, or you know, in trauma, you actually get raped yourself. That can cause psychological disorders. Learned helplessness. Again, feel, you know, actually having learned that there's no way you can escape from something harmful or emotionally troubling. You know, that can also cause psychological disorders. You know, when you can't escape, what is that? What are you saying to yourself? You're saying to yourself, well, I'm weak and I can't do anything to help myself. That depresses people. I know I'd be depressed if, if I constantly thought that I couldn't do anything to help myself or improve my life. Uh, and then there's mood related perceptions and memories. Again, that's perception. You know, when somebody says, hey, nice shirt. Are you taking that as, you know, uh, they're making fun of me or they're being genuine? You know, so perception is important. Um, social cultural influences, roles. Are you a male or a female? Sometimes being, uh, or, you know, in the case of uh, some cultures, let's say in Venezuela, are you uh, Native American or are you, you know, somebody that descends from the Spanish? You know, because of your role in society sometimes, you may have more psychological disorders because you're in a, a role that is inferior to other people. Uh, in the United States, I would be looking at black people and white people in the history of slavery. Um, so, so yeah, so there's many different things you can look at with roles. Or we saw that video on the guy that had a lot of stress because he was, you know, an inferior and he used to be yelled at by his boss a lot and it made him feel really bad and stressed him out. And he had anxiety as a result of that. So expectations, you know, what are your expectations in, in society? What are you expected to do? That can affect you in how you think and how you feel. Definitions of normality and disorder. Again, going back to what is deviant and what isn't and how does that change from culture to culture? Okay, so... Labeling psychological disorders. Um, very, very important study here that I have to talk about all right, when it comes to labeling. Uh, this very important psychologist by the name of David, actually, actually I'm going to type his name in here, David Rosenhan. Um, he did a study that, that just floored the psychological world when it happened. This happened in 1973. And what happened was uh, he wanted to, to study the power of bias and the power of labels. And so what he did, what he and seven others did was they went to, to a hospital admissions office complaining of hearing voices saying empty, hollow, and thud, all those kind of weird things. And the thing was, apart from this complaint, right, of just saying that I'm hearing voices, that's it. That's all they did. I heard voices saying empty, hollow, and thud, weird things like that. Aside from that, right, um, they answered any other question that was asked of them truthfully, right? And by truthfully, I mean as like normal function in human beings, you know, like what's your family life? Like, oh, well, it's good or it's bad or whatever the case may be. They answered questions truthfully. All eight normal people were misdiagnosed as a result of saying they heard voices. Were all misdiagnosed with disorders. Now, should we be surprised? Uh, you know, maybe not so much. You know, if somebody swallows blood, goes into an emergency room, and spits it up, should we fault the doctor for diagnosing them with, you know, having a bloody ulcer? Uh, probably not, you know. Um, but what, uh, but really, um, with Rosenhan's study, the important thing is what happened afterwards. Great. So they walked in, they said they heard voices, they were misdiagnosed. All right, hold on, I gotta sneeze. <laughs> <coughs> Whoa, there we go. Okay, so what the important thing was what happened afterwards. So they were diagnosed and they were basically, uh, you know, admitted into the, into the mental hospital. Now the thing was, right, that the, out of those eight people that went into the mental hospital, um, as, uh, they were there for an average of about 19 days. And that's incredible. Why were they there for 19 days? Because those people that went in exhibited no symptoms whatsoever after having been admitted of having any psychological disorder. So they went into the medical hospital and they sat around and they did their thing and they were completely normal. They didn't have like bursts of rage or they didn't have like, you know, weird, like they weren't like talking to themselves in a corner of a room, like tapping on their head and blinking really fast. They weren't doing weird things like that. They're acting completely normal. They could have normal conversations with doctors and nurses and all that, but yet it still took them 19 days to realize or to, to let them leave the hospital. That says a lot. It says a lot about the power of labels because when you label somebody as having a disorder, despite them acting completely normal, you still look at them and say, oh my God, man, they're weird. You know, they, you know, for whatever the case may be. Wow. Yeah. They seem really depressed. Look, he was just sad. They're depressed. Yep. For sure. Um, it's, it's going back to that self 
fulfilling prophecy that we've talked about before where you kind of just, you know, you look for all the information that backs up what you know while you discard all the things that you don't know. Um, and so, you know, labels, 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 very, very important. Um, and so you, that's why we want to be careful about labeling people. And that's why um, when you label people, sometimes it can be considered bullying because it has, um, it, you know, uh, really a, a really big impact on the way other people treat a person. And so, so, so David Rosenhan, very, very important study that he did there. Um, and another example here that I want to talk to you about is, is this. Um, they, they took some random people. They did a study where they took some random people and they, they had them watch a videotaped interview. Now, an interview being, you know, some person just asking them questions about whatever. Um, now, those told, right, the people watching the videotaped interviews, you know, those who to those that were told that the, the people who were the interviewees, right, who were being asked the questions were job applicants, right? Um, for those people who were told that the people were job applicants, they looked at the people being interviewed and said, wow, these people are really normal, no, no big deal really, okay? Um, but then another group, right, and this is the experimental group here. The other one was the control group, right? The experimental group was told that the people being interviewed were psychiatric or cancer patients. Now, what effect did that label have on the way the people in the experimental group viewed the interviewees? Well, it, hopefully maybe you've guessed, right? They, they labeled them, you know, I'm sorry, they didn't label them. They, you know, described them as being, for instance, different from most people, quote unquote. Um, and so, again, that label of being a cancer patient or a psychiatric patient, patient made them think that those people being interviewed were weird in some way or another, when really, they, they really weren't at all. And so, again, going back, labels are very important. All right, so anxiety disorders, let's go through some of these. And I'm going to try to go through these kind of quick because I'm going to look here. Holy crap, I've been talking for 36 minutes. That's way too long. All right, anxiety disorders. Here are some of the ones we're going to look at. Generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, I'm not going to go into crazy detail on these because we're going to watch more videos on this. So, number one, generalized anxiety disorder. This afflicts women more than men, actually, almost. Uh, two out of three people with this are women, so that's, that's a lot. Um, now, why? Possibly because women tend to have an inferior role to men in society. And uh, there's, especially in think of Venezuela and the United States, there's definitely added pressure to um, to have a, I guess there's an added pressure to look good and things like that and to have a, um, a body image that, that matches more, you know, that quote unquote ideal of what women should look like. Men don't have that as much. You can kind of be a fat so guy with like a big beer belly and, you know, still get a good looking woman where uh, women that aren't, you know, that aren't the prettiest of all, they have a much harder time. So, um, so yeah, this afflicts women more than men. Uh, Sigmund Freud called this uh, free floating anxiety. This was anxiety and this is the really bad thing about, um, really bad thing about this is that it was free floating sorry i kind of just had a mental pause there um free floating meant that um you you really couldn't you, you didn't know what the cause of this anxiety was if anybody's <laughs> ever had anxiety um hopefully you know what's causing anxiety crap i got a test oh man i got this big important volleyball game or basketball game after school so that causes anxiety that's normal um but free floating anxiety as freud called it is anxiety to which you don't know the cause and that's you know that's very that causes more anxiety. Oh my God, I'm anxious, but why? I don't know why. Crap, now I'm more anxious. That's, you know, that's really bad. But some other uh, symptoms of this, I'm just going to kind of read off to you, are people that have this, uh, they worry continually. They are constantly worrying. They may be jittery. They may seem agitated, right? Uh, they may be sleep deprived. Uh, concentration is difficult. Um, let's see what else here. Uh, facially, right, if you're looking at them, um, they might have furrowed brows, which means that they're distressed or upset or something like that. Uh, their eyelids may twitch a lot. Uh, they may tremble. They may perspire or sweat. And they may fidget a lot, you know, whether it's bouncing a leg up and down or moving their hand constantly or, you know, things like that. Those are some, some things. Um, so that's generalized anxiety disorder. Um, so I don't know if there's anything more I wanted to add to that. No, I'll move on from there. We can talk about more of this later. 
All right, let's go over here so I can move down. Okay, uh, panic disorder. Uh, panic attacks are, are basically, you think you're having a heart attack. It's actually pretty pretty scary for somebody that's had it. The definition in your book is an anxiety disorder marked by unpredictable, minutes-long episodes of intense dread. That means you're afraid, in which a person experiences terror and accompanying chest pain, choking, or other frightening sensations. So people that have panic attacks, right, um, they actually think they're having a heart attack. It's really scary. But in fact, they're not having a heart attack. Um, it's basically all psychologically driven. And But it, it scares people immensely when this happens. And, it, and it, I don't know how often it happens. It says, uh, for one person in 75, your book says, with this disorder, anxiety suddenly escalates into a terrifying panic attack. So one out of 75 people with panic disorder. Um, so panic attacks are even less common than the panic disorder itself. So, all right, phobias, you guys are probably aware of phobias. Phobias are extreme fears. Now, these are extreme fears, not just, oh my God, I'm afraid of snakes, but like, I'm so afraid of snakes that even, even when they're not around me, like I control or what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is controlled by this fear. And that's abnormal. That's not good because that affects your life and how, about, and how you go about your day-to-day -day business. People may look at you really strange if you have some extreme phobias. For instance, uh, people that are claustrophobic, right, that are afraid of enclosed spaces. If you've ever gotten them in an elevator with the lights turned off, they start freaking out, screaming, possibly start like, you know, hitting on the door to open it. They go absolutely crazy. Um, I've actually been in an elevator once when that's happened and it was really scary. But it was also annoying for me because I'm sitting there saying, calm down. Oh my God, it's bad. But don't scream. Don't freak out. Um, so that, and that's why it's abnormal. Um, here, uh, there's a lot of, there's so many different disorders here. Um, I don't even know a lot of the names. Claustrophobia, um, arachnophobia, fear of, fear of spiders, fear, fear of spiders. Um, a lot of people actually, most people have social phobias, which is you know, afraid of being around other people, you know, that makes them feel very uncomfortable. And so they try to avoid that. Um, you can look at it as extreme shyness, actually, in, in one sense. Um, all right, and then there's agoria, agoraphobia, which is fear or avoidance of situations in which escape might be difficult, right? That would also be the claustrophobic in an elevator, right? If you're in an elevator and you can't escape, um, well, then people are going to freak out. All right, here we go, some phobias, and here's the prevalence of phobias in society, right? And this is really probably a U.S.-based population. Percentage of people surveyed. Um, now, this is just fear. You can see the, the key down here with the, with the um, actually, I'm going to go here. Yeah, there we go. I like that. And I'm going to go to my pointer. I haven't used this yet, right? So fear, right? So about 7%, roughly, 7 8% of people are have a fear of being alone or a little more of storms, right? At the highest point, fear of a certain type of animal, like a snake or a spider, is up towards 22%. Now, that's a fear. That's not a phobia yet. Um, so you can see a lot of people are afraid of things. So let's go to, let's kind of want to move on. Here we go. And, and now the green is phobias, right? So here you see the percentages go down a bit. People that have a, a, a gore, a, no, I'm sorry, like a, a fear of being alone is about 3%. Storms, 3%. Water, 3%. Imagine being afraid of water. I think that's not drinking water or taking a shower, but more so like, uh, you know, falling in a lake or something like that, possibly. Um, closed, enclosed spaces, which is claustrophobia, flying, right? So, so not too bad that the highest point, animals, right? It's at like maybe a little more than 5% of people have a phobia of animals. All right, so uh, moving on. Um, Obsessive compulsive disorder. This guy is a, it's kind of like a host of a couple different shows, TV shows in the United States. His name's Howie Mandel. Actually, I think he did America's Got Talent more recently. Um, but Howie Mandel is obsessive compulsive. He does not shake people's hands because he is maybe what you can consider a germaphobe. He's afraid of germs. He has an extreme fear of germs. So he doesn't shake people's hands. He tries to avoid touching people. And when people do touch him, right? He, he wants to wash himself obsessively, uh, compulsively until he feels he is cleaned off. So things like that. So obsessive compulsive disorder. One way to look at obsessive compulsive disorder um, are, you know, there's kind of two ways. What's going on here? Whoop, that hurt. Okay. Right. Obsessions are repetitive thoughts. Kind of going to that. I just needed a reminder there. So an obsession is a competitive, uh, a repetitive thought. That won't go away. Like, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, you know? And 
that just won't go away. And because it's so repetitive, it actually distracts you from many other things in your life. Now, compulsion is repetitive behavior, right? So if you have an obsess obsession with being clean, you may also have a compulsion of cleaning yourself. So you might sit there and wash your hands every two seconds. Now, again, this is bad because it distracts you from your daily life and prevents you from doing more productive things with yourself. So uh, you see a lot of obsessive compulsive people that are hand washers, as I just described, and checkers, people that like, let's say they have a desk and they have to make sure that, you know, their, their phone is only one inch from the edge of their desks and their stapler is only one inch away from their phone and then their pen is in this one certain exact location and if it moves from that you freak out and you have to move it to the exact location you feel comfortable with it comfortable being in um you know i can give you an example of that when i see you guys so but you already probably have an idea of what that is so again going back to this screen obsessions repetitive thoughts concern with dirt germs toxins terrible things happening fire death illness or symmetry order or exactness right uh Percentage reporting symptoms, 40%. So concern with dirt germs and toxins is by far the most prevalent. Um, then you have compulsions, repetitive behaviors, excessive hand washing, bathing, tooth brushing, or grooming. I had a roommate once that brushed his teeth probably five times a day. I don't know if he was compulsive, but obsessive compulsive, but five seems like a lot to me. All right, anyways, percentage reporting the symptom, 85%. So I guess it isn't too abnormal, actually, then. Um, you know, maybe I'm the abnormal one. Uh, by not brushing my teeth that many times. I do it at least once a day. Okay, I shouldn't talk about this. All right, so here we go. All right, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, PTSD as it is popularly known. PTSD, and I clicked so it goes. So PTSD is shell shock or battle fatigue. Post-traumatic stress disorder happens when you are in a stressful situation for an extended period of time. And as a result of that, um, you are constantly stressed out. This happens, as you can see with this picture, with soldiers, people who are, are, in, you know, um, you know, in a war zone, and are constantly in, you know, in a in battle, in in situations where they could die at any moment, or where they see people being killed, or, you know, they are killing people themselves. Actually, you know, all those things. But you don't have to be in war to have PTSD. It can be in many situations. Uh, if you're in a situ abusive relationship with a man or a woman that, that hit you constantly, that can cause PST, PTSD. If you're a student in a classroom where your teacher's super mean, maybe that could cause P PTSD. I'm not so sure. Um, I'm guessing that's what happens when you're in Carlo, Mr. Ma Mr. Matthews's class uh, over the years. Um, all right, post-traumatic growth. Some people, I'm going to actually click on this because this is interesting. This is has to do with kind of the humanism, actually. Positive psychology uh, changes as a result of struggling with extremely challenging circumstances in life crises. So the fact that uh, this, this constant, um, you know, being presented with stressful events constantly over a period of time may actually cause growth in somebody because uh, it makes them stronger, you know, in some way or another. So, all right, so there's two ways of understanding anxiety disorders. There's one is conditioning, which we talked about. You know, think of fear conditioning. Think of little Albert from uh, when we learned about um, conditioning. Uh, remember little Albert and John Watson? John Watson was the guy that, that like would have like uh, a rat run around little Albert and then like strike this metal pole behind little Albert to scare him. And so eventually he associated the rat with that scary noise so that he now was afraid of rats, even though before he liked them and he'd like hug them and pat them. You know, now he hated rats because of the way John Watson conditioned him. Uh, that is also possible. That is one way in which, you know, anxiety can be increased or even learned, you know. Um, you know, and so what happens is... Um, from there on, and this happened with little Albert, stimulus generation. This can cause anxiety or it can maintain it, right? This is like, you know, um, if you're with the rat and you hear the metal pole and it scares you, you don't like rats. And so then any other animal about the same size as a rat that has four legs and a tail, this could be a small dog, you might extend that fear of the rat to the dog because they look similar. That is called generalization, is when you mistake something with... I just clicked. Okay, when you mistake one thing with one thing with another, that looks pretty similar to it. So uh, reinforcement is also another thing. Sometimes the things we do to reduce anxiety actually um, perpetuate the anxiety or the phobia we may have because it feels good when we do something to reduce 
uh, a phobia. Like if we have a phobia of being dirty, um, washing our hands reduces that anxiety that we have. And so as a result, that may actually increase the phobia, believe it or not, you know, because we're seeking for that, that pleasure moment when we wash our hands and reduce the anxiety that we get. So then there's observational learning. Again, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about um, uh, conditioning. Um, we said, you know, if you see a parent that is afraid of uh, dogs and they always scream when they see a dog, you might also become afraid of that dog. So that's observational. Then there's the biological perspective. Natural selection, again, going back to, you know, um, um, evolution, right? Evolution can cause anxiety disorders. Uh, genes, right? There's, you know, they say an anxiety gene possibly in us, things that actually affect um, certain, you know, uh, receptors in our brain that, that, that certain parts of our brain that influence, you know, different neurotransmitters that, that cause anxiety, right? Glutamate is, is kind of one of these, actually, um, one of these neurotransmitters that affect anxiety, believe it or not. Uh, glutamate, actually, it says here I'm reading, uh, is with too much glutamate. So that's a problem. If you have too much glutamate, uh, the brain's alarm centers actually become overactive and you actually have more anxiety. So too much glutamate equals to a lot a lot of anxiety. All right, and then there's the brain, the interior cingulate cortex, which is what you're looking at right here. Um, this is basically a region that monitors our actions and checks for errors. Uh, this seems especially likely to be hyperactive in those with, with certain anxiety disorders. So, um, so all these things can have an effect on, on you know, anxiety, but it's, it, to understand anxiety, you know, we have to understand that all these things affect it. So, you know, I'm going to stop there, guys. I'm sorry this took so long, um, but uh, I'll talk to you more if you have any questions. Again, please get back to me uh, by email. Uh, I'll check it once before we have class on Tuesday for sure, um, and we can discuss it. But I'm going to show you some uh, cool videos on these things with some uh, instances of instances of people that have these disorders that I just talked about and we can go from there all right guys enjoy your weekend have fun and I will talk to you soon goodbye